Great. Well, um, I'm joined for this next session. Um, again, looking a little bit more at the wider um, benefits of land reuse, um, looking at a few different case studies across Scotland. And um, so I'm joined by Anna Toza, who's Associate Director at the Scottish Futures Trust Land Team. Um, she works with public bodies, including the NHS, colleges, Police Scotland, um, on their programmes and strategies for the sale and surplus assets. Um, and she will be talking about a site in Inverness. Um, so Anna, if you'd just like to, oh, that you've unmuted yourself, brilliant. Um, if you'd just like to, to kick off, thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks for the introduction, Cathy. And a good morning, everyone. I'll just try and share my slides. OK, so I'm, I'm going to briefly outline the programme of surplus assets that I'm involved in at SFT to hopefully provide a bit of context on the reuse of public assets and how they can support the delivery of wider benefits, particularly around place, economic investment and housing, and give some observations from our experience of engaging with, with public bodies on this. Um, although the scale of some of the assets we're involved in may be different than the, the element of private sector involvement may be different as well from some of the more local and, and community led initiatives on vacant derelict sites, hopefully many of the issues covered will be familiar and relevant to you. So just briefly on the disposals programme, this was set up about nine years ago, working with the Scottish Government, and in recognition that additional support and resource could help to address the pipeline of already vacant or soon to be vacant NHS sites as a result of estates rationalisation and relocation to more modern facilities. So the initial focus of the programme was on the 14 NHS boards across Scotland and has subsequently broadened out to work with Police Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council and colleges on some of their major sites. And the aim was in part to prevent more sites becoming vacant and derelict, so to avoid a further legacy of VNDL um, and the impact on places and communities associated with that that we've heard about this morning and provides the context of the session, and also to accelerate capital receipts from the sale of sites that could then be reinvested. Um, the programme provides additional support and resource to the public bodies to help progress the sale of surplus sites, and particularly the more challenging and strategic ones, and it principally focuses on providing real estate-led planning and technical support and resource to enable earlier intervention ahead of a sale, and this ideally taking place two to three years before a site becomes vacant, but clearly that's not always the case. Um, it also enables lessons learned from individual sites to be shared across the programme and between different public sector bodies. The portfolio of sites is very mixed in terms of the scale, location and characteristics, but with some common themes, including the potential to address areas of risk prior to sale, particularly in relation to issues around title, planning, listed buildings um, and ground conditions, etc., requiring early engagement with key stakeholders. So at the start of the programme, a reference group was set up, bringing in expertise and resource from a number of different stakeholders, including Historic Environment Scotland, the Scottish Government Property Division and the Central Legal Office, to raise awareness and discuss the challenges across the portfolio of the NHS sites. So the sale of a site is, of course, just the start of a process of delivering wider benefits. It is, however, a key stage in identifying what some of those might be and identifying potential opportunities for their delivery and who the key players are in helping to achieve them. Many of the projects will involve the reuse, economic reuse of an asset by a public or private sector uh, purchaser or body, or the repurposing of a listed building, which unlocks reinvestment to secure its future. So, for example, the former Royal Hospital for Sick Kids in Edinburgh, which includes multiple listed buildings at both domestic and institutional scale. In addition, the sale of the majority of sites will enable economic investment by releasing them for commercial, residential, civic or mixed use development, and also create an important opportunity to contribute to the local placemaking agenda. This is particularly true in our towns and cities, of course, for example, the sale of the former City of Glasgow College Met Tower site, um, which many of you may recognise as a Glasgow landmark. And this was sold for an office led redevelopment with refurbishment of the listed building, which forms part of a wider placemaking agenda in what is emerging as the, the Glasgow City Innovation District. Equally, it's evident from the programme that the rationalisation of a major public sector asset can have a disproportionate impact on smaller places. <clears throat> excuse me, due to the scale of, of the asset relative to the town, such as rationalisation of the NHS Highland Hospital uh, facilities in Loch Gilphead, where a place-based approach is being established between key stakeholders to consider future, op future options of a surplus area of a large hospital site and its potential to deliver wider benefits to the local community. This is also particularly challenging in locations with low land values where various sources of public funding may be required in order to help create the conditions for further investment. 
Moving on to other types of benefits, um, a significant number of the sites um, have also been provided the opportunity to deliver housing for different scales and tenures, also bringing opportunities for community engagement around use or ownership of green space and woodland, helping to increase biodiversity, as well as providing health and well-being be benefits. In many instances, the sale of sites will involve private sector housing with an element of affordable, but on certain sites, there may be the potential to deliver a greater amount of affordable housing or specialist housing than would otherwise be delivered through the planning requirements facilitated by a public to public sector disposal. So for example, sale of an NHS, NHS site to a local authority or to a housing association. Um, as the programme has evolved, so too has the thinking on how the outcomes and benefits it helps to capture, uh, deliver are captured. It also reflects the reporting um, of outcomes at a corporate level across the all work streams at SFT, with an increased focus on outcomes related to inclusive economic growth, place and net zero. And there is currently work underway by external advisors to look at the metrics around this. So in addition to some of the existing metrics around the number of sites sold, capital receipts secured, GVA and homes enabled, we're starting to look at how we can more overtly consider wider benefits relating to place and social value. But over and above the facts and figures, an approach we found particularly useful across the programme is the use of case studies and real life examples to draw out lessons learned and practical approaches to repurposing sites, such as the example of Mid Mills in Inverness, which I'll now come on to. So Mid Mills is one of three sites that was vacated by Inverness College when it moved to its new campus at Beechwood in 2015. And although the site was sold some time ago, it's quite nice to see the whole story from uh, initiating the work through to actually sale of the site and actually completion and uh, demonstrating some of those benefits at the end of the day. So the site is located in the city centre within a conservation area and close to a residential neighbourhood. It's just over four acres and is dominated by the Mid Mills Academy building, which is category B listed, dating back to 1895 and has a long history of education use in the city. Although it's a very attractive building and a central part of Inverness, the challenge was to find a purchaser and range of uses that would enable conservation and long-term reuse of the listed building, whilst also providing a viable and sensitive development on the remainder of the site. As with many sites, the, the starting point was really to, to fully assess the constraints and opportunities, to work with the college to procure the right advisors to market the site, and to engage with key stakeholders, in particular Historic Environment Scotland on the listed building and the Highland Council on the planning and design brief for the site. We knew that the site could potentially accommodate a range of uses, including residential, hotel and civic, and that there was potential demand for these, but that there also needed to be flexibility in how the private, public and third sectors responded to the site, specific constraints and opportunities, particularly given the scale of the listed building relative to the remainder of the site and the potential scale of costs involved in its repurposing. So the site was marketed at both a, a national and local level, and it was important that the agents could provide contacts both at a local level and also discussions with parties that might come into the Inverness area that weren't currently represented. Um, it was marketed with the benefit of detailed information on technical constraints such as ground conditions, asbestos, tree preservation orders, and a detailed planning and design guidance document developed in consultation with the council. So this enabled a dialogue with interested parties around how their proposals might meet the brief, as well as, as, well as the college's requirements on timescales for the sale, and enabled parties to develop informed schemed and financial proposals. A two-stage process was ena enabled parties to engage with potential partner organisations also interested in the site, and a key focus for assessing the offers was deliverability of the proposals, so not just the headline price, but also uh, certainty around the proposed end use for the listed building, and the likelihood of the purchaser securing planning consent for the remainder of the site, which was critical to delivering a viable solution. So in terms of what happened, uh, the sale of the, the site was purchased by McCarthy and Stone and the Highland Council in 2017, enabling the development of 60 private flats for the elderly by McCarthy and Stone and 31 affordable homes for the elderly delivered by the Highland Council and opened in, in 2019. Uh, these provide much needed specialist affordable housing that can be adapted to meet the changing needs of its residents in a location where they can easily access city centre facilities and become part of the surrounding community. 
The listed building has been restored and is occupied by the WASPs charity for a series of 30 artist studios and the former assembly hall has been transformed into a public event space, uh, providing ongoing community based use of the building and public access to the site. So in this case, the wider outcomes from the site were delivered by three different parties from the public, private and third sectors working together to provide different funding streams and a complementary mix of uses within an overall master plan. And with one party, in this case, McCarthy and Stone, taking the lead on purchase of the site. So just to conclude, conscious of time, um, a few key points from our experience of working with public bodies um, on the sale and repurposing of their vacant sites. Inevitably, the approach uh, to identifying and delivering benefits will be very specific to each individual asset and its circumstances, its location, its market potential, the level of community interest and its site constraints. And as part of that, there may well be competing agendas and considerations for the public sector around best value and what this means for the sale of its asset. Early stakeholder engagement and pre-sale pre work to assess site-specific constraints and opportunities are particularly important in reducing risks to all parties involved and setting the framework for wider benefits. And ultimately, a collaborative, viable and sustainable approach should help to uh, maximise the potential for their delivery. Thank you. I'll hand back to you, Cathy, shall I? That's great. Thank you very much. Really interesting points that we'll, I'll definitely pick up on in terms of best value and how you think more holistically about those wider benefits. Um, yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, and we'll now move on to uh, Linda McConaughey, who is Service Delivery Manager at the Green Action Trust. And um, Linda will be talking more about various projects. Um, I think it's in the wider Glasgow area as well as a few others. Um, and how um, the Green Action Trust are working both with the local authority and um, communities on the ground. So, Linda, over to you. Okay, so I've been invited to speak today about a green, uh, our environmental regeneration project that Green Action Trust has been working on um, in partnership with Glasgow City Council and the Seven Lost project for almost five years. Um, and as a project which has um, delivered environmental, social, um, and also economic benefits for the communities of Craigend and Garthamlock, which is near Easter House. Um, we received £418,000 from the Vacant Derelict Land Improvement Fund to be split over two financial years. And we're actually just about to start on site with the project, um, which will, is due to end in, in June. Um, I've been asked to talk to you today just um, to talk you through the development process that we went through, um, how you can actually use an environmental regeneration and vacant dirty land improvement project to deliver multiple benefits for the community and also the environment. And also just at the end, just some ideas to think about, about how you develop multiple layers um, into your project. Okay, so I just want to reiterate that this is a partnership project and um, there's been a huge amount of effort involved um, to get to this stage we're about to go on site. Um, uh, worked very closely with Scott Ferguson, who I think has jumped in um, and will have a few comments at the end, um, who's a Seven Lost Programme Manager. Um, also my colleague, um, I'm a delivery uh, development officer for the project, but my colleague, um, he's Alberti Landscape Architects Green Action Trust. And I've also worked with multiple people across all departments in Glasgow City Council, who we have consulted, who provided advice and guidance. Um, and also just like to thank as well, Michael Gray's team and housing regeneration, who assisted with the Vacant Derelict Land Improvement Fund application. And just to mention the funders, again, Vacant Derelict Land Improvement Fund through the Scottish Government, some Heritage Lottery Fund money through the Seven Lost Project, and also um, some money from the Innovation um, Greening Fund from Glasgow City Council. I'll just give you a brief overview um, about the project. It's in the heart of um, Craig End and Garthamlock and Greater Easter House. Um, it is owned by Glasgow City Council, who are a very willing and enthusiastic landowner, which is um, part of the battle um, whenever you're dealing with vacant land. Um, it is a very densely populated area and um, with almost um, half people living in flats and social housing, which must have been incredibly difficult during the pandemic. Um, it's also a high deprivation, particularly in terms of health, employment, income and also um, educational attainment. So those were four things that we really wanted to address through this project. Um, and there are things that you can address um, through an environment re regeneration project. It's been vacant um, for over 30 years. Um, the reason for this is that there was red blaze kit pitches, um, which are now grassed over, um, but they have also provided perfect habitats for fossorial or grass and water voles, 
which is fantastic, but also provides its own challenges um, for the community. And it's something that we want to address um, through this project, we want to protect those, but also um, I'll go on to talk about why that's actually quite um, a difficult thing for the communities who live here and also regeneration of the wider area. Okay, so I'll just give you a bird's eye view here of the site. Um, this is it here. Um, in terms of, it's actually um, mostly amenity grassland, but this area in the middle is the area that's colonised by grassland waterfalls, and it's really rank overgrown grassland. Again, they're protected species, which means that you can't go in and cut the grass. Um, so actually it is quite unsightly and unusual for local people. Um, there's also some really nice mature trees, and then there's one, two, three paths that actually just cut across the site, and they're really used as cut throughs um, for people get into local shops. Um, it's the health centre and the community centre. Um, there's also um, actually seven schools surrounding the site. Um, a lot of them are kind of like composite schools, and there's two special needs schools. Um, there's two LNRs, this is the gateway to um, Seven Lost Wetland Park and the Seven Lost Trail. Um, so really it's quite rare to get a site in, this, um, in Greater Easter House um, that is actually designated as an open space of this size. Uh, there's quite a lot of pressure for um, housing regeneration and housing development and also water bowls have actually colonised a lot of the grassland areas which means they're just left as grassland. So um, whenever we started looking at this project, um, it's actually got a very good strategic fit. It was identified in numerous Glasgow City Council strategies, um, um, and the open space strategy, it's an underperforming space, and also because it's vacant land, um, it was actually designated for remediation and improvement. Um, it was also identified in a feasibility study for the Seven Logs Wetland Park as a really important north-south link. Um, to the, group, the wider green network. There's actually, um, the motorway runs here. Um, so this was an area that wanted to be designated um, as green space, but also improve it in terms of habitat, access, connectivity. But in terms of space making, um, it was actually a gift to actually get a site which is more or less a blank canvas. Um, it is, um, there was so much scope for it and we were really really keen to build in as many benefits as we possibly could for the local community um, and uh, we were able to kind of do that um, the site just gave so much potential it also is um, a relocation site for water bowls they did move into the area during our we started this project in 2018 um, but it's actually going to be used as a relocation site which means that we can transport water bowls to that site which then frees up other site for um, environmental regeneration okay i've just this slide has just captured um some of those um the kind of the opportunities that it provided to us and the main one as well is being able to go in and remediate an area of land that's classified as vacant, which as well kind of just changes perceptions. But the main element is that we want to create a new, attractive, usable and safe space um, for people. OK, so um, this is just uh, this is our master plan for the site. Um, you can see the main thing that we have wanted to do is to improve access in the site. Literally at the moment, there is just these three paths which cut across the site. It's just a cut through, but um, this is an incredibly busy road. Um, and also the, the Seven Lost Wetland Park sits up here. So what we wanted to do is try to create as many opportunities for um, active travel to the schools, to the shops, also create circular routes within the site for recreation, um, to encourage people to get out and well-being and that was all backed up by um, consultation with the local community. The site is crisscrossed, this area is where all the water bowls are and it's just really long grass, people are walking through it um, but it's not really fit for purpose. So that was where the, a lot of our budget has gone in, is trying to improve um, the access to recreation. This is going to be a three metre tarred active travel route which then links up with another a cycle path into the um, the Seven Lost Wetland Park. There's also um, improving links from the um, houses uh, and also some informal routes as well. There's also a lot of habitat um, improvements. Uh, again, most of this is just grass, so there's native woodland. This is the first tiny forest in Glasgow that was um, created last year. There's bulb planting, wildflower meadows, 
there's an area here which is at the way. So um, Hazel is designed in a wetland area. Um, and then also there's no amenities on the site at all at the minute. So we really wanted to create opportunities um, for people to kind of get involved and also create an outdoor learning space um, for the local schools, which will be fully accessible. Um, and also there are um, some community artwork um, and bins and seats as well, because again, that was something that came out of the community consultation, so actually creating it more um, as a focus for community activity. Again, I've just um, captured some of these just for future reference. Um, and we've consulted people as we've gone along. And we've also, there's been numerous levels of consultation, but um, going forward, there's also opportunity for the community to get more engaged in the site. Um, the schools will be helping to create interpretation panels and some art features. CCB will get more involved in the project as well. There's opportunity to take part in actually some of the planting. Um, but the main aim is for us to create a safe, attractive, usable, multi-purpose green space, which can then set the foundation for then how that space is used in the future. And the ultimate goal is then to remove that from the vacant and derelict land register. Okay, I just um, capture some of the milestones. Um, that just, just to kind of talk us through how long this project actually talked, uh, took to develop as well, but also um, just because of the nature of these projects, we actually started discussions in 2018. Um, and then quite a big, uh, one of the things that moved us forward in the project is that we were able to secure some money um, from the um, Glasgow City Council's Innovative Greening Fund to actually bring in a consultant to do a um, technical site um, assessment and appraisal and a feasibility study and also to produce some concept designs which we could then consult um, with the community and also um, stakeholders like people across various departments in Glasgow City Council. Um, I've also just um, put how much these things cost um, because whenever you're building um, a project this is actually quite a key stage so that you can then look at various options, what are the strengths, what are the opportunities, and then start to build in as many multi-purpose um, benefits to your project as possible. During that time, we also discovered that water voles had um, moved into the site, so we had to do a water vole survey, find some money for that. Um, but at the end of this process, um, we had some outline designs and costs, which we were then able to um, talk to the community and stakeholders. Um, but the overall cost um, was 1.25 million. Uh, I'll just say at this stage that to begin with, we actually explored if the site could be used for flood attenuation. And that was, uh, there was a potential, but whenever we actually did more investigation into that, um, a decision was made that actually the cost of it didn't justify um, the benefits. So we stripped that out of the project. And again, it wasn't a priority for local people. They very much wanted to just use site better. It was more access and just a nicer, more attractive environment. At that stage, um, Green Action Trust, we took the project in-house um, and our landscape architect, Hazel Clare, started to work on that. Um, and we also, Scott um, and I and various partners started to actually just focus on um, habitat, access movements and also um, create your community amenities. Um, again, that was strongly supported by the community. Uh, so he's already worked the designs and eventually we got to a stage where the project cost um, 568,000, which was much, much more achievable. Um, we then decided at that stage as well, it was still quite a challenge to find funding for it. Um, so we had decided that we were going to split it into two phases, that we were going to do the access improvement works using the Heritage Lottery Fund money from the Seven Logs and also Glasgow City Council funding to deliver the access works and then go in and do the habitat enhancement works. Um, we didn't necessarily want to do that because we felt that it was um, important to deliver this project in one go, but um, we were just trying to work out how we could actually deliver this work. And then the Vegan Dirty Land Improvement Programme appeared um, like a gift from God. <laughs> so um, it really was exactly the kind of fund that we were looking for. Um, we were able to put in the full um, project. Uh, and also, I think the fact is that we also already had very detailed designs, we detailed costs, and we were confident that we would be able to um, proceed to site. And we'd also done all the communication 
community consultations, we really had a project that was just sitting waiting there. And thankfully that fund appeared. Um, so we were able to um, access the funding. Okay, so just um, a few um, little comments about maximizing the benefits. Um, first of all, take a bird's eye view, look at your strategic fit, um, speak to the community quite early on. People are um, concerned about doing that because they're raising expectations, but I think people understand that you don't actually um, necessarily have money for it, but it's really important to get their views. Um, trying to create multifunctional, multi-purpose um, spaces, build strong partnerships, and multidisciplinary teams, try to get money at where possible um, to explore different options, keep the faith. Um, project development is actually quite, a, uh, it's not linear. You'll be setbacks, vacant land can be quite slow progress, but actually just keep the faith. Um, and we all essentially in, in this um, project wanted to make a difference um, to people living in the area and the environment. Again, the importance of, of actually investing time in upfront feasibility work. Um, and also just to shout out, if anybody has a project that they have in mind, um, if you want to contact me at Green Action Trust, we have got expertise in developing and delivering environment regeneration projects. So happy to talk to you. And that's me. <laughs> that was really useful. Thank you. And, and I like those top tips at the end there. I'm sure everyone will take note of those. Um, I know we've got Scott in the room today. So if Scott does have any reflections and wants to come in, I'm not putting you on the spot, but please feel free to chip in. Um, I, yeah, I, I had a question about this idea of best value and um, perhaps looking at the longer term benefits that land reuse can deliver. Um, obviously a longer term endeavor to, to bring some of these sites forward. And both when you look at the long term sort of change that's required and, and disposing of assets and thinking more um, proactively about, about your land and assets, but as well as dealing with some of the immediate issues, we need to think more broadly about the wider economic benefits and the environment and social impact. And um, how can we how can we start to, to embed this thinking in practice? I mean it's obviously happening, but are there are there examples or, or any tips that you could give to some of the local authorities here today on, on how to make the case for thinking more long term about these sites? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to come in on that one. I mean, I think that's definitely one of the challenges we had on the programme, particularly because um, some public bodies were sitting with quite historic book values of their assets. So I think, you know, public and private sector bodies trying to be realistic about the value of their assets and also the costs that they're incurring, both in terms of time and holding costs, for example, um, things like listed buildings, maintenance, security. So looking at maybe the whole value equation rather than just the actual, you know, end value of the asset in terms of what it means and what it can do to contribute to a local place. But I think those discussions probably for some of the landowners um, really come through engagement between key stakeholders and understanding what that, that wider opportunity is. And some of that may be very difficult for them to translate into pounds, shilling and pence, but it may actually deliver on some of their strategic priorities as well. So I think having that early conversation is, is really important. That's useful, thanks. Linda, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's sometimes quite difficult as well with environmental regeneration projects to kind of demonstrate that, um, you know, the benefits, because some of them are quite intangible, but I think there's definitely growing evidence of how, you know, improving paths and access actually contributes to health and well-being, but then extrapolating the output monetary um, savings in terms of, um, you know, NHS. Um, it's something definitely that's a, a challenge. Um, with us, but I think we definitely have lots of, of, of growing evidence for this. Um, again, it's very much, I suppose, surveys in terms of how people are feeling. A lot of this is about how people feel about their, their local area. So definitely whenever it's an economic project, you can see where you can probably, there's some very, um, you know, the, the definitive economic outcomes, um, but definitely with environment regeneration projects, it's trying to demonstrate that. Um, and sometimes it's just a lot about change of perception, how people um, use an area. Yeah, and I know that's something that the, the Vacant Dirt Land Investment Programme is keen to see these multiple benefits and stacking. Um, and we've actually got a question in about the longer term maintenance arrangements for the Glasgow site. 
Yeah, well, look, the site is owned by Glasgow City Council. Um, Scott might be able to jump in here, but um, obviously we have worked closely with the grounds maintenance and as well, one of the things that we do at the Green Action Trust is from the very beginning to actually uh, make sure that a site is maintainable because there's no point um, creating a, a site which is then not going to be maintained properly or they can't actually maintain it properly. So that's um, a very, very important part in the project development. And... Um, the site will revert back to Glasgow City Council Maintenance Department and there's, there's a maintenance regime for it. I think I can see Scott's jump there. Yeah, yeah uh, just um, to add to that, one of the... Uh, the, the council is a, is a key partner in this project and some of the maintenance, ongoing maintenance of the site will be undertaken by the council. Um, we also have an ongoing partnership through the Seven Logs Project with the conservation volunteers. Um, so they run a training and employability program, they run volunteering programs. Uh, so elements of the maintenance may be carried out by the voluntary sector uh, through an employability program. And given the location of the site, we are also hoping that the local community and particularly schools might become involved in assisting with some of the, uh, the maintenance, whether that's low level uh, undertaking cleanups or uh, litter picks, uh, there's already volunteers involved in the maintenance of the, the tiny forest and that was one of the elements of, uh, of setting up that project was that the schools would have an ongoing role uh, in helping to care for the, for the forest. So again, it's that mix of uh, public sector taking on some of the routine, uh, but looking at adding value through community engagement. Um, and interestingly, we, we're now seeing more vacant and dead land sites coming forward uh, for regeneration, but with, with the principal driver being the local community. Uh, rather than the, with this site, it was identified by us, but we're increasingly now seeing sites being identified by local communities as sites that they want to bring forward for greening. Yeah, and I think you both talked about um, the role of master planning in all of this as well. And uh, just again, if, if you had any views on on how you go about the master planning process. Uh, do you think there are opportunities to the new national planning framework and local place plans to sort of link that up? It's an open question to, to anyone who wants to take it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that it's, I think the master planning um, stage is just really important, um, just simply because, and I think that's what we did, we, we can, lay over different layers in terms of GIS. Um, we actually brought in a consultant to do a lot of that options appraisal for the site and do a lot of the detailed site um, appraisals um, and investigations. But yeah, absolutely opportunities um, for that. And it's about looking at all the different, uh, that's what I kind of meant with the bird's eye view, looking at all the different strategies, looking at all how it actually fits in. I suppose that's also get, gathering your information whenever you're applying for funding applications, that it's delivering in multiple agendas. So, um, yeah, I think just spending time at the beginning of that process, just having a real good assessment of the site and how it fits into the wider strategy and the landscape, um, particularly in terms of green networks work with the kind of work we do, is a really important um, starting stage. I, I would certainly echo that in terms of an approach. I mean, for some sites, it may not actually require kind of a, you know, a full scale master plan or, or that much work. And, you know, in some instances, it's as simple as kind of looking at the title issues and understanding, you know, the extent of the ownership. Are there any third party issues, any any telecoms issues? That's been a big point for, for some of the sites we've been dealing with. And actually just having some really sort of nuts and bolts kind of assessment of the site in terms of what you own, what the constraints are what potential either time or effort or small amounts of funding could actually make a difference to change the perception of that site and sort of unlock opportunities for, for subsequent investment. So I think, you know, while some will need a large scale master planning and, and the sites we've looked at that and looked at, you know, planning permission in principle, uh, others, it'll be fairly light touch and actually may just require a real sort of, you know, focus concerted effort, I think, from our experience. Mm, that's really interesting. And Anna, do you think that there's, um when you come across an ownership issue um, and that is a challenge to delivering the wider vision for a place, how do you go about that at, at SFT? 
Well, I, mean, I think it, it very much starts with um, uh, a nuts and bolts kind of legal review, which may not sound particularly sexy, but is actually <laughs> very important in terms of understanding, you know, whether there's a third party ownership that needs to be acquired to actually unlock the development or just in fact what, what the body actually owns. Does it own what it thinks it owns? Because I think over time with some of these sites and some of the sites have been sitting around a long time, the kind of corporate memory changes because people have come and gone. And actually you just need to reestablish what is the baseline you know do we need to look at you know registering the title putting it into one title if it's in multiple ownerships and just simplifying that as a starting point um, rather than necessarily looking at, at you know kind of a large land assembly issue mm -hmm. thank you so does anyone have any questions does anyone to, to actually feedback and reflect as well you feel free to raise your hand we've got about five minutes left or so um don't see any yet. So I've got I've got another question linked um, again, sort of um, Anna, but also Linda and Scott, if you have any views on this. But um, everyone's been talking about collaboration and partnership working today, which is which is great. Um, but what do you think um, it takes to create that successful partnership? And we'll be looking a little bit more at this in week three. But I think because you've, you've all spoken about the benefits of engaging with communities, but also getting the right people around the table. Um, how, how do you make it work? Oh, sorry, I think you're, you're on mute, Anna. Sorry, apologies. Uh, I mean, that's quite a question for, for many projects, isn't it? I mean, I, mm. I think um, starting early and I think um, being clear about, you know, what the issues are, what the constraints are and bringing in different expertise and resource from different organisations. I think, you know, no single organisation has the answers. And I think we, we set up this reference group, as I mentioned in the presentation, which brought in, you know, Historic Environment Scotland and um, uh, Scottish Government Planning uh, Property Division. And it looks at kind of the scale of the challenge and what are some of the issues and what things actually can people do. There were some things that, you know, would require masses of funding, but what things can actually be done that can make a difference. So I think that early kind of engagement and understanding the agendas of different parties. So, for example, the NHS selling a site may have different priorities to a local authority selling a site. And just having those kind of early engagements around where the, the common themes are and where the opportunities are. And in many instances, I mentioned again, a place based approach, having that kind of place based discussion at an early stage to understand what an asset or a site means to a community and what it could potentially be in the future whilst trying to find a kind of a viable and deliverable solution for it so yeah I think I think those sort of early open conversations are, are probably where it starts I would suggest thank you Linda Scott yeah I would just uh, add in from a from our perspective that the, the seven loss project is already a, a partnership project so we have multiple partners across the statutory sector and the voluntary sector, as well as, as local community partners. Um, but as Linda mentioned in her in, in her presentation, th this project has been kind of five years in the making. Um, and I think with partnership working often, there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be to be done. Uh, and I think it's also very fair to say that we wouldn't be where we are now if we hadn't uh, established the partnership with Green Action Trust. So they've um been able to uh, to pick the project up and really take it forward in a way that that we in in the uh in the council didn't have the capacity to do um and i think that that expertise in you know having a good understanding having a partner that has a really good understanding of these types of sites and the types of challenges that are faced by local authorities in terms of resources and coming up with a design and a, a design solution that is appropriate. Uh, the first design that was delivered by uh, uh, a commissioned uh, landscape architect was really far too ambitious for us in terms of being able to take that on uh, in, uh, and maintain the site into the future. So we had to really scale it back to be, be something that delivered on what the community was looking for and delivered a, a site that, that provided multiple functions, but also was a site that was something that uh, the council felt its uh, grounds maintenance uh, and operations teams were, were going to be able to, to take on and maintain. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, again, 
I think one of the things, all the projects we work on, we again work on partnership as well. And I think that's uh, not been afraid to reach out to people who have skills and expertise. Um, I think the wider partnership, you can actually um, build a better, it makes a richer project. Um, it's also really useful to have some money to bring in consultants, um, which is you know, a bit of resource, even just um, temporarily. Uh, um, but again, I think all partners having the same goal, I think it's trying to kind of like um, ease that apart, but particularly whenever you're actually bringing in people, um, you know, professional partnerships, um, it's actually that it delivers for other organisations as well. So, and but as well, that creates a richer project with lots of different multiple, um, you know, functions and agendas. Uh, but as well, sp spend some time at the beginning as well, thinking who else you might want to involve in the project. Yeah. That's an important point. I think actually it complements what we're talking about, the capital funding, uh, sort of, you know, different funding streams like the Basement Outline Investment Programme, but also spending time and, and resources on the, the feasibility, the early, the early side of things as well. Um, right, well, I, I can't see any more questions uh, apart from a comment. Yes, Sheila, we're, all, the, all the presentations are being recorded and we're sharing some uh, resources um, at the end of these sessions as well. Um, including funding tables, community route maps and things. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but again, Linda, Anna and Scott, thank you so much. Thanks, Scott, for, for popping in um, as well. And um, yeah, lots of really useful lessons there. And please do keep these conversations going and reach out to, to SFT and Green Action Trust. Um, but I'll, I'll wrap up here and um, we'll, we'll now hand back over to Andrew, who will um, just sort of complete the complete this morning session with a few final words but but thanks everyone on the panel today thank you thank you very much um and well all of you thank you very much actually that really was um i thought tremendous uh and uh just underlined the extraordinary wealth of experience and information and and, a, and the growing kind of body of expertise that 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 that, that, that we've now we're now getting you know in scotland i mean you know, it's not that long ago that I wouldn't have seen SFT as being particularly focused on this sort of thing, and they're right in there leading now. It's tremendous. So great. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I, I, I won't keep you long, but I, 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 just a few sort of closing thoughts I think are worth ha ha having. I, in a way, I want to go back to where I started from. Um, I don't think we can underestimate the importance of this work for Scotland. Um, we do have an awful lot of vacant and derelict land, whether it's on the register or not, and that point was made near the beginning. Um, we do have a lot, and we have a lot uh, concentrated in certain parts of the country, and we have a lot concentrated in, in areas of particular um, disadvantage and deprivation. So you can see that as a problem, but you can also see it as a fantastic opportunity. My goodness, I mean, if you could, if you know, if we could turn around the VDL situation in parts of Glasgow, we could turn around Glasgow and therefore we could turn around one of the most deprived areas of Western Europe. So, you know, don't underestimate the power of that. That's a phenomenal opportunity for people working in public agencies. And, and you know, it's the kind of thing that I'd like to be able to take them to my grave as having had a, an influence over, you know, the, Never mind, you know, we don't all work for money and um, or not only for money anyway. And the, 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 this is a tremendous area of opportunity. So I, I, I want to underline that um, it is about regeneration. No, no question. It is about economics, but it is also, as was made, the point was made earlier on. It is about productive use. And frankly, it doesn't in some senses, it doesn't matter what we want. So the, the Land Commission in, in 2017 started off by, by saying, we are in the business of making more of Scotland's land. Uh, and that means making productive use of, of Scotland's land. And that that's what took us to, to the BDL. Um, we can contribute to well-being. We can contribute to regeneration. We can to contribute to economic growth. We can contribute to, to net zero. Uh, we can contribute to community resilience. We can um, contribute to climate resilience. We can contribute to self-confidence, self-esteem, um, all sorts of things through this. So, um, and I guess just a wee personal point, I spent the last eight years as chair of Scottish Canals. Um, and, you know, we took over the canals from British Waterways in 2013, when they were uh, eventually devolved to Scotland. 
Um, and, and that whole process, the whole of the last eight years has been about taking assets, they weren't on the VDL register, but taking assets that were massively underproductive as compared with what they could be. We now have assets right across Scotland, central Scotland, but also in the Highlands and Islands, not the Islands, but Highlands. Um, these assets are massively more productive. There are millions and millions of people out on these canals that weren't out before. There are lots and lots of people doing things that, you know, whoever thought about magnet fishing, for goodness sake, eight years ago, and now you've got rafts of people out throwing magnets in and, and all the rest of it. So we are making more productive use of those assets. And it's, it's been a very moving experience, actually. Um, so, to all those who've contributed one way or the other, a massive, massive thanks to your to, to, for your contributions today. Um, to all of you who have participated and attended and listened and and and, and chipped, chipped in on the chat or chipped in on the on on, on the, the, the 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 group the, the what do you call it the chat room thing. Um, you know, I think that's been really valuable. I've been in on, on some chats which are, I, I you know really found inspiring actually. Um, this is the beginning of a, of, 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 of a month of, of, of activities. There's a lot to come, a lot over the next few weeks, loads of events. Um, to find out more about that, please um, go to our website. There's loads of stuff there. Kath has been frantic on Twitter this morning, as have others, so you can find it all there. That's terrific. And if you're in any doubt at all, please email us because we'll do it. I mean, we will, we're a wee organization. Let's not kid ourselves. Scottish Land Commission's about a dozen people. Um, but we we will do everything we possibly can to help to signpost you to and, and all the rest of it. So if in doubt, get in touch with us. There's the if you go, if you're on the chat, if you're not, click your chat button. There's the, the the website there and the email address there. And if if you're just at your wits' end, email us and someone will phone you. Uh, so please please please, we will do what we can to help you. Um, but nothing, ultimately, my experience of all this is nothing beats either doing it or talking to people who have done it or going and looking at people, places where, th where things have been done. So there are loads and loads of people on this, the, the, on this conference and who, and, and who will be participating over the rest of this month who can inspire you way more than we can, actually. So please, you know, contact folk who have spoken, contact people who you know. If you don't know anyone, contact us and we'll try and find, find you someone near you who you can talk to. But absolutely nothing beats talking to people who have done it. It really, it, it really is enormously inspiring. Um, and last, I suppose, no, not last, I've, I've got one more thing to say, but second last, I do, I do want to thank everyone who's taken the trouble to participate this morning. I'm sure you've got plenty of other things that you could be doing. Um, so I'm very grateful because I do think Scotland depends on you. And that's, I think, probably the last point I want to make. Um, I think we sometimes underestimate in Scotland the power of public sector leadership. Um, we, we, this, we will deal with the, we, we will deal with the challenge and we will make the very, very most of the opportunity inherent in vacant and direct land uh, if we all um, believe what, that we can. Um, far too often I find myself out and about talking to people and what they want to talk to me about are about the problems. This is absolutely about opportunity and the public sector and all of you, I think, have a a huge opportunity and, I, and argue, I would argue a huge responsibility actually to really deliver on the, on, the, on the leadership challenge here, to really talk this up. You've got so many tools at your disposal nowadays with social media and all the rest of it to talk stuff up. So let's talk this up. Um, I, I, people get fed up with me bleating on about Scottish canals and I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I use that again, but you know there are so many really inspiring examples that are on, your, on our doorsteps out there, all over Glasgow, all over Stirling, all over Edinburgh, all over the place. Um, and some, some fantastic local authorities doing extraordinary things. Um, uh, uh, we've heard some examples today, including, including in Inverness and all these places, not all in central Scotland by any means. So please, 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 um, you know, see yourselves as, as, as absolutely the leaders in all of this. Thank you again. Um, safe journey to your fridge for lunch, I guess, is the last thing I should probably say. Um, 
it seems bizarre these days but that, that's the that's the nature of meeting so thank you enjoy your trip across the house and uh we'll i, I will be look forward to seeing all sorts of inspiring stories on twitter over the next few weeks and months see you